into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no. The games that begin. I like uh, how it tells us that we're all being recorded, and I'm realizing that the reason it does that is for you know secrecy. Like if one of us was uh, not telling the other that we're recording this conversation, it's sensitive information, they wouldn't be able to get away with it. Oh, oh yeah, dude, I would totally be using this to get secrets out of you and blackmail but I wonder- you. I wonder if, well, you're in New York, which is a one-party consent state, but if it, there's different settings in, like, a state that's one-party consent, they, like, they don't tell people that it's recording? I'm in Virginia, which is a no-consent state. <laughs> uh, yeah, but Virginia's is a, a state for the state. fellows. Yeah. Oh, uh, yours is better. Yours is a lot better. But you're in Virginia? No. no okay. Fuck. Yeah, um, Jake's calling in from Virginia this week. <laughs> yeah. Perform. Well, that is, it's interesting you said Virginia because that's the, what was an issue in uh, American Crime Story Impeachment because one New York is one party consent. Virginia, where uh, Linda Tripp um, records Monica Lewinsky, is not. If you're not familiar with the term one party consent, I feel like you should very much clarify we are not <laughs> talking about sex. We're talking about this thing where um, in New York... For example, you can legally wear a wire and then record someone and then bring it to court and use it in court. My, in fact, we did that against my landlord. Really? The Serpico law. Yeah, my landlord was saying he wanted to burn our building down. And somebody what? Got, somebody got audio of him going like, I ought to burn this place to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> like with you in it? Um, I think he was more talking about insurance, but you know, I mean, it was if people recording. are in it, they're in it. So, all of this is fake for the purpose of legal stuff. In case anyone wants to, in case my landlord is listening to my podcast, which right. it could be a thing, honestly. And Jake anyway. has been recording in Virginia since he joined Naval Intelligence because that's, that's where right. a lot of that is based. Yeah, no, they're, we're trying to overthrow Mexico this time. It's a really complicated. How are we going to get in there? Strategy. It's really big. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the post holiday trip to fan out, fucking chilled out edition of the podcast. While the drop is drop. I'm Jake. That's Alex. There's a plane passing overhead, and I'm happy to have you on the show. Wow, Welcome. Yeah. Sounds like shit today. <laughs> Anders is here. Anders Lee here, coming in from St. Paul. Yeah, Anders' setup, I think, is worth discussing. We can see the Vikings game behind him. That is not the Vikings game. I would not be here if this was the Vikings were on. All right, well, who is it? That's the Colts and the Buccaneers. Oh, I'm sorry. All these big, beautiful men look the same to me because I want to. I want to <laughs> have them. My, I'm in my uh, parents' apartment, and they have one room for audio, television, and guest room. They're all in the same room. Did your so, parents try to get on the app? Are they trying to brute force their way in? Yeah, I, I blockaded myself in here. My mom did want to make an announcement about the language that encourages <laughs> us to use better language on this program, but. Uh, we can I, edit I that in if she wants to give a give me something. I can. I'll make the room. Do we actually want to hear that? Yeah, I would like to hear your mother giving us a warning about our language. <laughs> the curse word in the title of our show. Yet <laughs> I know it's <laughs> all the time. My dad said the same thing once. <laughs> it's really funny. We're not very close, you know. And you talk once a once every long while, and then. One time I didn't talk about dad for like two years, and then he just texted me. He said, what is Twitter? Like, <laughs> All right. Let me explain. Jake, Jake's dad texts him once a year to be like, I'm in the Legion of Skanks now. Yeah. He's the <laughs> last dad of the week. Nice. 
I'm skank pilled. You're a lib, and I'm triggering you. I'm your dad. Yeah, Parents just don't understand. <laughs> that is a that's oh. a relationship a lot of people have with their fathers, from what I've come to understand. Is like yeah, I mean, fathers are it's a stoic relationship between a father and a son. Nobody wants to talk, or say anything, and it's I, we like I like it that way. You know. You just, know what I have to say about that? No comment. Yeah, let's just stare at each other and play golf or something. I don't know. I just there's like a full TV behind Anders, and I'm lost in the idea of these strong men leading me to good times. <laughs> Tom Brady is on it right now, so... Oh, yeah. and then me there leaving a weak man, leaving to bad times. He really, truly... He truly is the uh, masculinity paradox, right? Because he's, like, the greatest competitor probably of all time in at the quarterback position. That's but correct. he's also a metrosexual. He gets his nails done, hair done, all that stuff. Is so, he really... I guess yeah. he is kind of like a, he kind of reminds me of like Homelander from the boys, like a yes. blonde <laughs> man type thing. He's the Ubermensch, right? And yeah, that he's like a yeah. famously beautiful man. I think the metrosexual thing comes from like Tom Brady will forever be stuck in the year 2005 culturally, you know? And so metrosexuals are like a new thing to him. He's like, I'm doing my nails because I'm pretty. Oh, yeah, because you're stuck in the year you got, like, rich or whatever. So he's just blasting uh, my uh, fucking, what was the big band in 2005? Like my Chemical Creed. Romance or my something. My Chemical Romance. Well, yep. I wonder if it's even, because the year he won his first Super Bowl, is his second year in the league, he was a backup, and it was 2001. So it's like the 9-11 season, and the Patriots won the Super Bowl. So that probably messes with your head. Right. To a large extent, so he's it, like, I am the chosen American, and I have to keep winning these. Like, it's just my destiny now. But it takes yeah, a few yeah. years to kick in, and so like 2004 metrosexuals would be big to him. And then here's the thing, and this is a big discovery I've stumbled upon. You gotta be a metrosexual to play football, because you gotta get all those rings. Oh, oh, true. Okay, yeah. Right, and the more rings you win, the gayer you get. That's right. You win... A lot of sporting events, you get rings, you get belts, you get... It's almost like an RPG. It's like uh, Dark Souls or something. You yeah. just get multiple like, accessories that are very flashy and cherished. And they and up we, your stats, which is a positive feedback loop. Yeah. If you win the Stanley Cup, you drink from the, the, the cup, cup and it... <laughs> It you get a potion your, <laughs> in the cup. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sports. They're they're just like us. They're for nerds too. You know, sports are just you know, like us. There's a guy in I think he's Canadian whose name is literally Stanley Cup. So he just goes to like big hockey oh, cities and drinks for free for like an entire weekend. Because people insane. are like, what? "Why would they serve you for free? <laughs> just because your name is Stanley Cup?" Yeah, if a, if a city wants to win the Stanley Cup, they're like, "Oh, we got Stanley Cup here." Bartenders hate this one trick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that what an incredible scam. I mean, what a great scam on his part, just convincing people that that's a thing. That's not a thing. <laughs> Yeah, my, my name is actually uh, uh, the Whiskey Shot, so you got to <laughs> give me Whiskey Shots. <laughs> yeah, that's good times. Strong men like, um, what's his face? We were just talking about lead to good times. Tom like Brady. Stanley Cup. Tom Brady leads to Stanley Cup, leads to weak men like, um, who's weak? Andrew, right. football, plug in football names. Oh, a weak football player, uh, Chris Cluey. Yeah, like would Chris be considered Cluey. weak by traditional standards. He is a former Vikings punter who came out for uh, gay marriage before oh it was okay, my God. and is also like really into Warcraft now. Probably due to the <laughs> influence of Tom Brady. Probably due to the influence of trying to get that ring. That's a Warcraft thing. My ring. Yeah, he probably has many more of those than he did uh, get Super Bowl rings. That's true. How about strong it. men lead to good times lead to the weekend hosting the Super Bowl halftime show? Did you guys like that? Did we already talk about that on here? I know that's a year old. I liked it. 
I thought it was really confusing the way he would like he looked kind of looked like the sorry to bother you guy, but it wasn't really explained. He just had like a busted face with gauze over it the entire time he was performing. Yeah. They did a lot more camera tricks than usual. I liked the camera tricks. Yeah, I like anything that mixes it up, you know. Um, I was just thinking actually about do you guys remember the two thousand three season, the Super Bowl then? With, oh uh, yeah. Well, you you will remember this part the uh, the little debut Janet Jackson's breast of her TJ television. Yeah, I saw it live as a child. Yeah. You did. I'm yes. really jealous of you because I was watching it and I remember uh-huh. watching the beginnings of that uh, dance, but then I had to go out and shovel snow, and I missed <laughs> I missed the nipple. Yeah, when I saw the nipple, actually, it led me to hard times. <laughs> <laughs> My drift. <laughs> well, I think that was such a bullshit scandal because when you're watching it, like, and this is the thing with the the forbidden access to titties in general, is it doesn't yeah. look like anything until we all stop and rewind a hundred times. <laughs> oh, so it, it was just a blur in the moment. Yeah, it's like an inch on your TV, and people are like, don't look! It's forbidden! <laughs> right, well, it makes no sense. I mean... Outside I've, of the video quality, it's also just an absurd social taboo. Yeah. Like, you, her pits were mostly out before that, and then right. just a small section of it was uncovered, and it's like enough to bring an economy to its knees. That's <laughs> insane. <laughs> <laughs> it makes no sense. The because, jewel like, of the empire. <laughs> yeah. The way the rating system works in this country, if you're a child who's like 13, you watch PG-13 movies, you can see someone being shot to death with a gun, but you cannot see a nipple, which is the very thing that you probably, unless you're adopted, with, with the thing you ate from for it's right. a significant part of your life. So and That's why adopted I'm, people don't care about breasts. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of like people that weren't adopted that were probably fed from a bottle, I think. Yeah, yeah. Or if you're true. like raised by a wolf in the woods, then you wouldn't <laughs> care. But if you're no, you might you... drink from the wolf's wolf's nipple, are you kidding me? That'd be awesome. Like Romulus of old. Yeah, you get all strong. <laughs> That would lead to strong times. And that would lead to strong times, <laughs> which are different than good times. Yeah, which leads to good men. True. Well, I was wondering what would happen to, like, that would be such a great meme is because there's no, like, censorship on Twitter, right? So the instead of the weekend meme, it would just be Janet Jackson's nipple again and again and again if that had happened today, you know? Oh, yeah. What if? Oh. How yeah. would that have affected the 2004 election? If, hmm, if Janet Jackson had <laughs> not done that, well, it did kind of ramp up. It did kind of ramp up the culture war. Um, I don't know. It, I don't think it was a campaign issue. Well, I don't know. Maybe John Kerry wouldn't have been like, Dick Cheney's daughter has one favorite part of the Super Bowl, and she really enjoyed. <laughs> The halftime show. <laughs> right, that was a mistake when he did that. That was he yeah. wasn't sensitive. Oh yeah, because she's a lesbian. She's actually a politician now, right? Her sister is. Her sister is. Well, yeah, I mean, I I'm don't... not going to keep track of which of Dick Cheney's terrible daughters <laughs> are affecting my life. I just get the general concept. <laughs> I'm trying to. I don't know if they are reconciled now, but for a while, um, it was just the most nakedly, no pun intended, cynical move where Liz Cheney, who's the politician just disowned um her sister and was like yeah i'm against lesbians i think they should rot in hell right uh to get elected in wyoming and then pause for applause yeah (laughs) i think they should go fuck themselves (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's funny that that's more popular than like like that outweighs like disowning your own family because it is still like a family values ass take but right Totally okay to be like, I hate my sister, and that's what this campaign's all about. That's what this campaign's all about. You speaking of uh, politicians, did you see like J- Biden is floating Lindsey Graham for the Supreme Court? Oh, I God. did not see that. 
What the, the reason I this I'm so mad about this is because whenever like during the elections you would talk to liberals, the smart lib ass centrist take was always like, "Well, I'm playing the long game, and you have to think about the Supreme Court, so you have to vote for look at Joe Biden or whatever dickhead is running on the center ticket." Because the real issue is the Supreme Court, and like they were go, like Joe Biden was going to, you know, game out all of this by putting really cool, like, Democrats and shit on the Supreme Court. But he's right; he's playing fourth dimensional jacks. He's the fuck. <laughs> he's our what's his face? The the bad one way back in the day. That my name is escaping me. He's always been bad about the Supreme Court. Oh, Clarence Thomas. Yeah, yeah, there you go. He le- yeah, he let that he let that happen basically. I mean, yeah. He, yeah, he voted against, but he he presided over and just yeah, let him give him carte blanche basically. Come holiday black pill, man. About Biden, he's so bad. God, for, he might... for the holidays you are. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just laying down and not thinking about him. Eating a lot of turkey. I well, wish I could what... kick that guy off the Mayflower. Something we celebrate on last week's holiday. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is that's, that... this is when you're supposed to uh, defend Joe Biden, right? Is is at Thanksgiving. It's interesting how, it, for a lot of people in this country, November is the most, the only like political month <clears throat> of the year. In election year, you vote. Election year, it's extra busy because you vote and you have to talk to your relatives at Thanksgiving. And every other year, you save up all your takes for – you're supposed to save up all your takes for Thanksgiving. And that's your sort of political praxis is arguing with relatives. Well, you um, can take a shot at Christmas. But I think for Christmas, there's supposed to be a moment where it's like, hey, everybody, it's Christmas. Yeah. Right. Thanksgiving, that's part of the tradition. right? There, that's the, what the if way it's Santa pitched. Claus voted for Trump? Would you say that to him? Did you say that to Father Christmas if he decided that he was going to make this country great? Well, I don't know what I would say to him, I guess. Oh, it's not a genuine question. I just think that's something someone could say to you. Or a uh, rhetorical. Okay. I know you can't resist him. Yeah. (laughs) Just waving hypotheticals in front of Andrew's face. (laughs) You know what? I got that wrong. He's not floating Lindsey Graham. It's he's now the way it, the article puts it, quietly emerging as one of the GOP's most frequent supporters of President Biden's judicial nominees. Oh, Never mind. That's it, not it, even uh, kind of similar, Jake. Yeah, I know. Sorry, I want to misreport the news. Look, I'm full. Of- okay, but like when this comes out, that will probably be a headline. <laughs> like Lindsey Graham floated as Supreme Court justice. He's floating. He's like the Dune guy. He's floating in his little tank of Epsom salts. And he's yeah, to, to Jadge in his Lindsey Graham impression. I saw that last night. It's pretty good. Oh, shrimp Jadge. Jadge. Yeah. We love him, don't we? Have you actually yeah. been watching Saturday Night Live now? It clips here and there. Isn't it funny how someone you know can get onto this huge thing? You still won't watch that. I am now. not going <laughs> to even, for, not for a moment. I watch it um, like when the they do a good job and then their clips are on Instagram and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad he's on there just because it makes the show better or whatever, but it's a show for old people. I'm not going to start watching. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They, every so often, every like decade, they, they try to actually get in touch with the youth. And they're sort of doing that now. Yeah, I bet they yeah, I bet our, our fucking pals here are uh, just murdering with old people, and that's I'm so happy for them. They're just <laughs> so making sick. old people shit their pants from laughter in the old folks' home when they see Sarah squirm, and they're like, it's right. that clown lady. <laughs> She's what? got me, Sarah, squirming. <sighs> She's, why is she a clown? Well, you, you <laughs> saw the... the um... There's like Zionist backlash for casting oh, yes. Sarah Squirm. They're yeah. trying to, yeah, they're trying to cancel her. I, w- I almost don't even want to amplify it. Yeah. Because like n- nothing good can come of it. From well, I just, I just, I feel like the only point to make on this is like your internet drama with other people's posts on that level is like 
not going to affect Lauren Michaels. Like, if it was while she was getting hired, there's a window for these things. Well, I mean, that literally happened, though, you know? It did the, the happen, but, like, but do, don't you think, like, if he was on the show, it would have been too late? I don't know about that. I'm not sure how the contract works. I mean, the entire fit, like the entire, the whole discourse around that, like Shane Gillis thing where he got hired and then unhired because he, because of woke cancel culture and the mob and all that stuff was no shut up. That's not actually a real thing. What happened is he was somebody they wanted to make money off of by hiring. And then it turned out he was a liability because they have a contract that says, if you have old racist shit that comes up that we can get sued over, like we don't want to do that because we could lose money by hiring you. So with, I mean, if you're still on the show, I think that could actually potentially make you recallable at any moment, which I think is a, in a way, if you look like I, it's cool that our friends got onto fucking SNL, but like I would never even att- me personally, I would never even attempt something like SNL, much less, you know, I'm not going to get it, but like, but in the future, no one is going to be allowed to be on SNL except for people that <laughs> probably didn't use Twitter or like ma- made sure from the get go to just never talk about stuff like this. You could make a Chris Kattan in a tube. This is why it's going to become like a worse and worse show and why just like mass, massly appealing art is bad because it has to be the mickey mouse club it can't be anyone with like cool opinions or whatever yeah well yeah that's exactly but that's exactly why i didn't really like the show up until they hired uh james and sarah our pals uh because like it was yeah just like people with no like there's this thing in you know acting where they want people everybody to be just completely like clay right they can mold them into any character and that's a lot of the cast members on the show not to name names but they're people who just have no distinct like for lack of a better term brands but like personalities that people like tune in oh i want to see this you know like chris farley or adam sandler just like a unique sort of person um they have all these yeah like mickey mouse club members who are just dexterous actors and performers but don't really have they're like this is something I've, I, that came up a lot for me over the the holidays because you know who be on TV right now, who be on oh. TV every every five seconds you see him in something else. Jimmy Fallon has conquered our culture. <laughs> he is in everything, and he brings nothing. And I think it's such an indictment of us that that man is everywhere. <laughs> He at least, like- I will give him. He's very talented at imp- imp- like song impressions. And it is very funny, I will say, when he does, like, you know, uh, Neil Young or Bob Dylan playing ch- the Charles in Charge th- song or something like that. You look in this and, man's uh, eyes and you know that there's just a Sears commercial playing behind there. And that's why <laughs> they keep putting him in more of them. He did a really funny Jim Morrison one time. That yes, is Reading Rainbow. Yeah. 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 But but uh, did you know that he's like drunk out of his mind constantly? <laughs> yeah, I do you think oh, that really? part rocks? That's also Boston culture that he's celebrating and bringing around. <laughs> if you pay attention while you're watching that show, he uh, he has like a black eye that they have to cover up with makeup and stuff. Because apparently he's just he goes out and parties in New York City and falls down the stairs at bars and shit, and he's like constantly injured and stuff. Didn't he deglove himself, or was that somebody else? <laughs> God. God. Glove? Oh, that's one of those yeah, things. It's like all the skin on his hand. Oh. Yeah, whatever I think about it, it fucking makes me shudder. Apparently, that's a real problem with uh, guys that work in like cutting trees, you know, because you're up, <laughs> way up high. And if you wear a ring and you like fall out of oh, the tree, God. fucking ring catches a twig and it just pulls your finger skin off. This is worse than thinking about Lorena Bobbitt. Yeah, this sucks. I'd rather have my dick chopped <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> lose all the skin of my fucking finger. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, which it was rather? it was him. Although they're calling it a ring avulsion, oh. so I don't know. Okay. I don't know what that was. Uh, no. But I have a titanium re- wedding ring, so this is something I think about a lot. Yeah, what if Tom Brady was running like he runs fast past a tree and accidentally caught all of his Super Bowl rings on the tree? <laughs> Oh hand. God! Uh, then they'd all be ripped off a little bit, leaving a legacy on the tree. 
Yeah, that'd be sad. I mean, that would lead to hard times. Yeah, well, I was thinking that having the skin ripped off of your hand is hard times, and <sighs> that that's why he's such a strong man. <laughs> Make him even stronger. I mean, statistically, it's not going to end well. The guy's literally 44, 45, and it, he wants to keep playing till he's 50. And, like, storybook, he ends just on another Super Bowl, but, like, statistically, he's going to get his leg snapped in half or, yeah, his hand degloved or some nasty injury, and he's going to, like, have he's to be not forced to quit. He's not going to get degloved. He's not wearing the rings on the field. <laughs> well, yeah, some gruesome accident will happen, some violent just, I mean, it's it's Jimmy really Fallon's a wonder been of the world that he has not been and injured. He's fine. <laughs> Isn't it crazy though, like how much of a different world they're living in than us? Because like, I have friends that are in their fifties and they're just like ready to die. You know. Mm-hmm. This oh yeah. Out. This comes he up did. for me all the time because uh, a fucking Seth Rogen, and I do think that we should move on to maybe some of the the topics we discussed about beforehand at some point. But uh, Seth Rogen. Uh, is always talking about how he's never going to have kids because he has so many opportunities that his friends who've had kids can't pursue Ooh, <laughs> beca- because busted. he has so much uh, extra free time. And he's like, that's why I never wanted kids. I'm never going to have kids because they let me explore my life. And it's like, wow, that is one argument for having kids. Like if you're not millionaire superstar Seth Rogen, like what the fuck are you doing with your time? <laughs> Like Wait, you're not sorry. making movies all the time. <laughs> What's his argument? What's he saying? He's not having kids because he has free time, and it's like if he has what? kids, he won't be able to like make sausages too, or whatever. Oh. You know, like <laughs> I mean, I kind of feel the same way, but like, but that's that's because there's like a I'm not Seth Rogen, so there's extreme scarcity of time in my life where you have to. Jesus Christ! What is that sound? I'm gonna I'm gonna mute it out. It's fine. <laughs> I'm just, I don't know what Anders. Every time we record, you always have like a symphony going on on your end. I don't know how you do it, but I what hear like the back it? of your room and like tin cans and like cats <laughs> meowing. <laughs> Indescribable sound. I just want, I want like this. I, I know it's it's your bike rubbing on your shirt is what it is. My <laughs> mic isn't even on my shirt. And I see it. I physically see your bike. It's on your neck, and it it's fine. This is not. This is not. My, this oh, is it's my so mind. much worse now. God damn it. Okay. No, the yeah, the mic is on. Your, Tap it. Tap the one you think it is right now. No, yeah, you're it's not the talking. one on your neck. You dumbass. Oh fuck. <laughs> anyway, we're not changing it now. <laughs> God damn it. I, can I change it? Because this. Okay. Do you want to change it? Yeah, I mean, we're, all right. I, you you change it, but Jake is gonna say his thing now. We're we're okay. gonna move on. I set up all this stuff for nothing. Damn. Okay. Yeah, I, know, I had a feeling this is what was happening, but it's just every time we record. <laughs> how, about, how, about, how about this? This happens. So how about this? Tap it. Tap it. There you go. Yes, that's your, much, yeah, your, that's sound better. Through the microphone. Not yeah. really. It's it's the same, but yeah. It's okay. Way it's probably better. from 1983. It's better. Right Just turn it up, but it's better than the headphone mic. Okay. That shit sucks. I hate it. low key. I hate it when people do that on this show. It's, I didn't know why I was doing that. I thought it was. Yeah. I mean, at least I have headphones. Andrews so has pro- now switched to like an actual handheld mic, but it is from like 1974. So he just sounds like he's calling in on the Tonight Show. <laughs> My yeah. dad uses to interview Leonard Bernstein or something. <laughs> Jake, okay. what are you saying? Seth Rogen isn't having kids because if he had kids, he wouldn't get to do stuff. Totally fine argument. I think you're at will to choose to have kids or not. And uh, frankly, you know, we're not living in a time where like the, the social control here that would like impose upon you to call this a selfish argument is traditional. It comes from religion and stuff like that. I say, fuck that shit, do whatever you want. I feel the same way, but you're saying that this is different for, because he's rich, right? I'm saying that Seth Rogen's world of opportunities is so different that the world that you have, that you and I live in that like, it's not even the same landscape of decision for you at home. 
<laughs> as Rich it is people, from Seth Rogen. <laughs> celebrities often have kids and then just like pay people to raise them and shit, right? Like rich people don't actually have to do the stuff that you have that is like back breaking to raise children sure i mean and you can also choose to raise your kids if you're seth broken as well but the point is that he has other rich friends who've had kids and then they're not making sausages for meet the bratwursts but seth rogan is and he's getting paid and he's getting laid are you saying we know makes, that for a fact he makes dumb shit you're saying this is a dumb argument like he was in like the the seat the the uh, pixar movie where they're their food inside of a refrigerator and shit and the emoji movie, it's like this is why you're not having a kid, <laughs> so you can play a hot dog. <laughs> yeah, well, the, yeah, it is kind of. I'm. Just, I just think it's it's not relatable to people. I'm not necessarily saying it's dumb. I'm. Hey, if you're listening, Seth, I love your stuff. Super bad. I want. I want to be. I want to be the next high schooler you work with, and so keep it up. I'm just saying that it's not really relatable to most people. Interesting. I don't know if I agree with you. I mean, okay. People, uh, everybody has you know opportunities that are limited by having children at at whatever income level. You know, that's true. Not I'm I'm not saying that your opportunities aren't scale. limited. I'm just saying you will be spending that time like watching TV after your shift at the plant, whereas Seth Rogen is like getting blown at the celebrities uh, mask wearing club that they all get to go to and we're not supposed to talk about, but we all know they go to that club. He's trolling Eve Barlow on Twitter. You don't have the time to do with that if you're a father. Or you can't mother. do it. There's no time. Yeah. Eve Barlow starts to, like, you go to roast her and then you see your daughter's face over her and you're like, oh, what is this all about? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what it does. You're not a good, well, no, there are people who are good uh, antagonists who have children, I guess. That sounds like a good time, which leads to weak men. <laughs> it does. <laughs> uh, I'm one of them. I'm I'm weak from having a rocking good time. Is that is that what happened to you? You had too good of a time. What happened? Yeah, man. We're all soft now. We're soy boys <laughs> from having too good of a time. I'm on a couch and I'm eating grapes because of yeah. the life I've lived. This thing that I'm talking about, I was thinking about just not explaining it for the whole episode, but we might as well explain it. So Joe Rogan, I'll put this on his Instagram, and it's really funny because it's um, kind of a swastika. So he, it's, it's a picture of the political quadrant compass that we're all familiar with, which so there's top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left to indicate um in order authoritarian uh with uh, you know it's all the you know the shit um <laughs> uh, tanky uh fucking nazi libertarian dickhead uh anarcho everything's a psyop guy okay so in the quadrants respectively there's like in the top left one it says uh what is it the hard times and then there's an arrow and it goes to the next one which is the top right so it's to say it's as if to to say like you know communist authoritarian stuff is hard times and that leads to strong men which is the nazi quadrant and then go down to the ancap libertarian quadrant good times so strong men then make the world ready for good times right but then good times if we have they, too good of a time we go back at the bottom left anarcho territory and that's weak men they lead so, to weak men which Soy then boys. lead but they build communism so it goes back up to hard times and he posted this i was up at like when he posted it i saw it like instantly and uh it was like three in the morning you know and he's in texas so i guess it was like one or something and uh or two i don't know how time zones work but um it it's just really funny because he so a if you look at it it's kind of shaped like a swastika which is kind of funny because it also kind of means a swastika in like what it's saying um but it's <laughs> yeah i believe that, the nazi quadrant is uh 
hard men or something <laughs> strong men so it's yeah yeah it's, there's very little room for interpretation in this one <laughs> it's joe rogan who fancies himself a strong man who has a good time so arguably i mean he's in one of those two quadrants as self-identification i think but he posted it also with this like this quote um from i can't remember the exact like hindu philosopher or something but it's um it's neo-nazi shit and it's not that it, i think he's in like he's secretly reading nazi stuff it's that nazi stuff grows organically in the minds of dumb guys in his situation in society and so it's funny because I, I was making fun of him and then I went to sleep. I woke up and all his little weird, weird fans are on my shit and I just turned off notifications. But like, they're all like, it's not, it's, it's, it's not Nazi stuff. It's a really good podcast. It's just about having a good time or whatever. It's about Which being a he, strong man and having a good time. <laughs> yeah. Which leads to weak men. But um, I just thought it was really funny because it's like, it's, he, I guess is, sharing this theory of history he has which is extremely not material and just dumb guy like youtube loose changey sort of thinking you know mm -hmm. stuff we all know about him i mean those also uh jeremy levick and rajat like did that thing with tim heidecker this week where they just they just did a parody of an entire million hour long joe rogan podcast where they essentially sat down and did exactly this but on purpose as a joke making fun of him it was really funny but i i don't know i guess i'm just making fun of this a lot because well a the, the graph is just very funny because you can put it on like i put it over the let it be album cover and it fits perfectly it's john lennon is hard times which leads to paul mccartney which is strong man he's a strong man which leads to george harrison which is good times which leads to ringo which is weak man he's a weak man <laughs> it's like they what, knew because he know. wasn't as talented yeah that's it that is why anders i'm right. sorry but the beatles have had what 50 years to figure out where they go on the strong men weak men compass and we all are pretty aware of which one ringo is by this point <laughs> i mean strong mustache yeah, look, I, I know he's like, I know he's beloved because he didn't really do anything, so he's not as disgraced as the rest of them. But like, he's not the best musician in the band. Stop being so ironic about the Beatles. He's like still hustling now. You wouldn't have to do that if you were one of the good Beatles. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't have to come out with a new hit in 2021. <laughs> it's just him and Paul who are left, right? Yeah, John and George are dead. R.I.P. to the greats. I do think it is, it's not a good use of your time to try to <laughs> police Joe Rogan. I don't, I don't think that will lead much of anywhere. Uh, you think I'm policing Joe Rogan? No, I'm, I'm just saying the people who get really worked up about uh Joe Rogan's latest like Nazi guy that they have on there. Like remember when Joe Rogan in, uh, endorsed Bernie in the primaries for like five seconds, we were all, and all these people are like Joe Rogan. Once you have his stamp, that means you are letting in the, the, the jackbooted thugs to come into your camp. And I do, I don't think that's true, but the reason Joe Rogan, this is all Good. I wanted to say. The reason Joe Rogan is like not, a uh, 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 avatar of political concern mainly is that he is just a dumb guy with a really, really big audience. But the thing that he's missing is being plugged into some kind of like right wing machine. And I do worry as time keeps a ticking that he is getting plugged in there. And that is kind of scary because he has a huge fucking uh, 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 radio to uh, yeah. like use. Yeah, well, I've gotten into this fucking argument with kind of vulgar materialists a lot in the last few years because there's often this thing where it almost looks like we're going to be able to use Joe Rogan. So, like, shut up. Let's be nice to him or whatever. But, you know, 
talking about somebody in a in making fun of them and criticizing them and stuff like that isn't policing. I think it's bullshit to frame stuff that way, even when it's Twitter is all yelling about somebody, you know. And like the other thing with him is is okay, so I guess the reason I'm kind of obsessed with it is because I think if you're too vulgar of a little Marxist online or whatever, you're discounting the world we live in, which is you know culture is a battlefield and we're all online all the time and stuff and like there is this thing that's kind of alarming that's growing which is this dumb guy who is organically sort of turning discovering in. nazism for the first yeah. time <laughs> yeah. and it's like it's like um verhoven talks about like in like starship troopers and stuff like that where like the not when the nazis show up they're not they don't have a nazi flag they have an american flag like he doesn't think what he's doing is actually carrying all the underpinning qualities of exactly what fascism was in spain and in germany and all these other places but he, it is almost by virtue of the fact that he doesn't actually like know what he's doing and he's taking he's acting politically in a very passive way which is like mm. what what that's where all that like all the underpinning like a grievances that drive right-wing populism come from it's pa it's passive it's lazy you're not actively involved in politics you just feel like uncomfortable sometimes and you want an explanation for like what that is and you know here comes this fucking street philosopher you know uh who's a comedian whose job is to not really think that hard about stuff it's kind of like Chappelle. like Chappelle doesn't read everyone talks and compares him to like carlin and Pryor and stuff but it's like if you read one judith butler book he would understand this thing he's been doing for like three specials you know obsessing over gender but they sit around and they do it ontologically by just like arguing out or semantically or whatever to discover uh, these things for the first time is actually very natural because fascism is often described as what the id of the national character, the capitalist death drive, something that is a, the animal force inside of you. And you can take that same concept and just plug in the word swag, which is something yeah. you just discover. And that's what Joe Rogan's doing is he's having swaggy Joe Jordan Peterson on to figure out what being a man is about and how you have to assert yourself by the end of a gun. Yeah, and then, like, I guess with the other element to this, it, the reason I'm saying, I, like, I know I think you should actually probably keep an eyeball on this or think about it, something that can be done about it is um, Glenn Greenwald, who's just, like, you know, every fucking day, more and more uh, of an overt kind of fascist sympathizer. He... He really I'm, is having like maybe the greatest public fall from grace from our specific <laughs> cultural quadrant. I think it, in history, maybe I don't know up there with like Hitchens or something. Yeah, Hitchens. It's insane. Like a few years ago, I was like a fan of his, you know, and <laughs> he fucking, you know, it, I, I really, you know, what I dislike is the term mask off. Like a lot of anti people are like mask off. Like they're finally showing you who they really are. And that's like kind of good in a metaphorical sense. But with COVID, it's confusing, is what it is. That's also weird. Yeah. Dr. Fauci, mask off. But <laughs> like th there's all these like portrayals of fascists in new, like new prestige television and movies and like Jordan uh Peel movies and stuff like that, where it's it's a person who's secretly having meetings in a back room and they're in the Ku Klux Klan, but then they go out and they put on a costly a face and then they're like in normal society. And that's I don't think it's that overt. I think it's like the it's passive. It's like a thing that people don't even realize they're doing. So Glenn Greenwald, I think, still thinks he's like a leftist, like he's like on the right side of things. But he's literally on Tucker Carlson, like he's the, all the time, which is well, I think he thinks he's above ideology and that. Sure. Yeah. He, he's like transcends it or something. He's a it's Kyle like Rittenhouse leftist. Yeah. When Kyle Rittenhouse, when the when the verdict came out, he was all caps. He was like gleefully like acquitted, free <laughs> my man. He kept saying, yeah. <laughs> and you know everyone's been fucking dunking on him all week because it's wow, this guy's kind of showing what he actually has stewing around in his brain, and it's really funny. But I guess what's so alarming to me is like people all the time will just say like, well, why don't you just leave these people alone? 
and they seem massively influential. Like he's on Tucker Carlson, which is like the biggest cable news thing in America. And it's, you know, we just had a president that was arguably like elected by it. You know, it seems like it's not something that you could write off as like, oh, that's not real. That's that's the end result of you know, that's downstream from politics or whatever. Well, it's, I mean, it's funny. I remember before I had a Twitter account, uh, I would just like lurk, just go on it and just look at journalists I like who are saying different things you know, like 10 years ago. And one of them was Glenn Greenwald. And I distinctly remember him tweeting him saying, word of advice, if you're ever about to write an article about uh, an argument you got on Twitter, take a deep breath, close the document and shut <laughs> off your laptop. And then go and then go do something else. <clears throat> and he's just like, you know, it happens to a lot of people. You just go crazy. Like, like, yeah, I, it's a, it, there's an addicting quality to it. It's kind of like a, a cell phone game or something where you need to argue with people. And I get sucked into that. Just like anybody uh, who says something that I find stupid. I have this like, compulsion and you know everybody has this where you you need to like point out this is the logical fallacy or something like that and it drives you crazy and like you know uh he's sort of overcorrected based on you know like the with the anti-vax stuff um i don't know if, well the covid stuff he's basing his argument around like he, he, these things that he's saying are these prevalent ideas that like we can't have any cost benefit analysis with covid but nobody's saying that every of course we're all benef we're all measuring the you know risk reward of wearing masks in certain cases going sending kids to school that's a constant discussion we're always having and because he's talking to like some person with 10 followers who was saying like no one should go outside ever he's taking it as this prevalent view and and that's why in his articles he never he usually doesn't really cite any actual sources of like legitimate um outlets that are saying these arguments it's it just redounds to people on twitter saying stuff and that that's with the uh the verdict or the um coverage of the rittenhouse trial he's obsessed with the fact that some newspaper in germany and i guess brazil said that the victims were black no no u.s outlets has, have said that i guess if you're not playing paying that cl close attention you might think that but that doesn't really matter what what the race of the victims were that doesn't show some grand left liberal as he likes to say conspiracy about the media we're all increasingly inventing a chorus of yeah. people in our heads and then having a big public fight with them and it looks very healthy and is the sign of a good society that will but last I a million years yeah, that's exactly what's going on with him. Like I, that quote you said about him years ago saying, like, get get away, take a walk or whatever before you write something. I think that's probably him. Like he was saying that to himself, yeah. you know, to try to remind himself to stop doing this. And then, like, clearly over the years gave into the addiction. But like what I don't know if that addiction is specific to Twitter, I guess, is what I think, because like, mm -hmm. um. You know, there's this internal question of is online real or is it not? Like, is everyone in Brooklyn or is everyone on Twitter just in Brooklyn? Sometimes you look at it and you're like, oh, wait, yeah, like literally no one outside of this knows what any of this shit is. Yeah, but sometimes it goes the other way. And like with him, I'm kind of like, the reason I'm like, I, I feel like a crazy person who's like trying to over explain this is because I have so much personal connection to all of these fucking people like Greenwald. I'm fascinated by because. I was like a fan of his journalism and I wouldn't, even when he started to go crazy, I was never a Greenwald reply guy. I never was like, mm, is this you, you know, or right, the hot right. dog guy or whatever. I just watched him. And one day I woke up and he was tweeting about me and like at me and I had never talked to him before. And then I noticed that he also tweets about how he, his favorite podcast is fucking Red Scare. And he's always like, it's embarrassing. He's like, Anna said something so smart on the recent episode about the new Batman movie or whatever, <laughs> you know, and you're like, this guy is an authority on he's a journalist. Like he's telling people. 
about politics. He's on Tucker Carlson fucking, you know, giving this insightful point of view, supposedly. And I realized he doesn't like me because he listens to that fucking podcast and he's in these group chats with people like Twitter. One of the things that's really big is his group chats. And so like another example is, is I think um, kind of similar vein of person, Edward Snowden. I broke up with somebody one time at a breakup. She was in a group chat with Edward Snowden. And it just occurred to me that like somewhere in Russia that day, Edward Snowden, this figure from like history was like sitting on his phone going like he said what you know like <laughs> this is insane There's so you're an, now in, on the same side historically as the nsa yeah <laughs> 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 which is a complication of interests i'm sure but um you know the sure all of this stuff that's happening in this distorted little space online is like driving these people crazy and melting their brains and stuff but they have massive amounts of followers who I think they're regurgitating these grievances to. And when you meet somebody like, listen, I love this show. I think we, you know, we're dicking around today, but we make pretty smart stuff. We don't have as many fucking listeners as something like red scare because we're not selling like slop that appeals to people that are just living in this like lost anxious state where they need a fucking enemy to take down, which is a classical that's how bad political movements come about is you come drumming up these like um, scapegoats and stuff like that. And when people, when you meet somebody in a fucking bar in Brooklyn and they, they're like, have you heard about this podcast? And then they say one of the fucking horrible ones that's doing this. It's like looking at that guy and like um, in the mouth of madness when he's like, do you read Sutter Kane? Like, you're like, Oh no, Oh no. There's something is happening in this person's brain that, you know, it's taking them on a journey, but they already, here's my point. That person, 90% of that equation was already there because of the, all of the things that make up a person's life in society. Now, like the alienation and the meaninglessness of life in modern capitalism, you know, that, that leads people to be like, just kind of listless and like needing a thing to define your life. And there's no war for people to go to, and there's no fucking, there's nothing. So this stuff comes along and it's just like, it's, it's like activating people on some level into something really gross and bad. And like, yeah, you're right. There isn't a big fucking thing for it to be attached to, to catalyze all this into like something really scary, but it could happen. You know, Trump was president. I mean, that's pretty fucking scary, you know, and will probably be president again unless he suddenly <laughs> dies, which yeah. honestly, it's not impossible. But then there's like the other guy, right? There's like uh, more scarier, more competent, fashy people coming down the pike, you know, it's true. So far, none of them have been uh, have had like four friends in the world, and they've all just been like nerds who read books from the 40s who like wear suits. But, you know, it's a, it's possible to think that you could get a person younger than the age of 70 <laughs> who can attract a following. Um, well, I, what about like Tom Cotton and people like that? They, I mean, he's not as big as Trump. He's nowhere as big. Like people don't like trust Tom Cotton with their life. Like people are willing to die for Donald Trump. Like there's nobody yeah. there's not a comparable figure in the right wing. And the, the Democrats are in an even worse state because we don't even like we, they shot Bernie out of their orbit. There's nobody who animates their voter base anymore. So like the Republicans are left where the only guy who any of their voters like is someone they all hate and don't want to control the party. And then Democrats have no one. So anything could happen anywhere politically the next few years. But what we know now is that Democrats have power over every lever of our society and are fucking dropping the ball on the ground <laughs> and Ugh. crying on top of it. I can't right, which is Joe what's known as weak times. <laughs> it leads to <laughs> hard men or something. <laughs> the, the, the hardest men. And they're in the right corner. Um, I also th do think this the way that we were talking about Glenn Greenwald does remind me of what's been going on with Dave Chappelle. Who yeah. had a very funny thing this week. I have an article pulled up about it. Dave Chappelle visits high school alma mater, faces student complaints. Yeah, he went back to his old high school, which is a nightmare that people have. 
Yeah. But he did it on purpose to speak uh, kind of the same way when uh, someone successfully quits smoking crack, you get to go speak at your own high school or something. <laughs> I think this is being painted as like much cooler than it actually is. He's like, so I, his reaction to the situation, I guess, is like, if I was in this, probably <laughs> what I would do too. But it's also like, it makes him look so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's i think playing a fundraiser weeks after students complained uh, uh complaints led dc's duke ellington school of the arts to postpone naming a theater after alum dave Chappelle. the comic has faced off with pupils who took issue with his most recent special the closer which is the one which i have not seen but a large chunk is like him ranting about trans people and cancel culture and so there's like 600 people in a room and they're give, doing a q a with dave Chappelle. And uh, under as is absolutely going to happen at this event, eight students are reported to have questioned Chappelle about the special and jokes he made in reference to the trans community, with one repeatedly calling him a bigot, or reportedly calling him a bigot and telling the comic, I'm 16 and I think you're childish and you handled it like a child. <laughs> the kid was just calling him Tyrone Biggums. And he was like, I'm not a bigot. They called him a weak man. And yeah. so D- Dave Chappelle's okay. response to this is just like to floss on the entire student body of this high school <laughs> and be like, I'm Dave Chappelle. I- I've got a billion dollars. Uh, this is the quote. It says, my friend, with all due respect, I don't believe you could make one of the decisions I uh, I have to make on a given day. And then he goes to talk about how he's like the best living artist and that none of them will be better than him. <laughs> <laughs> the decisions to a 16 year old just fucking dunking on like a room full of children yeah which the, the main comparison i've seen online about this is like somehow a more embarrassing version of when cat williams tried to fight that 12 year old and then got put in a headlock and knocked unconscious <laughs> yeah <laughs> Did you that, ever was see that that was, was actually good. good comedy though and it, there's uh, a video of it, so you don't even have to like read some bullshit article. You can watch Cat Williams go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just see if I can find. I have it pulled up here. One of the one of the one of the questions in response to another antagonistic question. It says Chappelle roughly told the student body of artists, "quote I'm better than every instrumentalist artist, no matter what art you do in this school right now. I'm better than all of you. I'm sure that will change. I'm sure you'll be a house. You'll be household names soon. <laughs> it's like, oh. Here's the thing. It's, 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 it's kind of very, very, very absurd to just like sort of compare different forms of art on the same scale. Um, but if we're going to do it, then any musician at, any level above like total novice is better than a comedian. Like it's just apples and oranges or not even apples and orange clementines and granny Smith's in terms of like the actual, uh, dedication. It's clementines and Grammy Smith's right. That's the thing we always say. Yeah. It's so much harder to be a music. Like I, I couldn't do it cause I'm too retarded, you know, like the, the comedian, <laughs> you literally just have to <laughs> embarrass yourself over and over and over again. And it's not, you don't have to really, practice i mean i guess you do but the practice is just in embarrassing yourself it's extremely easy it's right. not the same you thing sh- as practicing violin or some shit Chappelle drinks a lot like i've as a bartender served him before and he parties and i know what that is it's the same reason i drink a lot it, it's part of comedy is all it is is getting better at not embarrassing yourself which booze just helps with <laughs> like it, it's not is that practice? No, you're absolutely right, man. I mean, I like comedy, but it's I'm not good at other stuff, and that's how we arrived here. It's like a low yeah. form of art. I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, couldn't draw a crooked line, man. This so is like, I have no business yelling at somebody who like plays the tuba or something. Yeah. <laughs> it really is a rehearsed skill of just like having no shame. Like uh yeah. the ball out super discord a few weeks ago. I don't remember specifically what happened but was just all owning me for doing bad accents. <laughs> like in a group, like six of them were just like, and he's got nothing to show for all his years in arts or whatever. And Katie <laughs> came in and defended me. It was like, everyone be nice to Alex. It was like, 
I don't fucking care. <laughs> I've been publicly humiliated at pizza restaurants. People were just having dates at. Like this is nothing to me. <laughs> yeah, and that's what Chappelle. I mean, that's what he's doing is just make. He's being a heel, right? That's what we're trained to do is just make asses of ourselves. You know, I guess that's what he's he's doing his job. I guess. I think there's case. something universal in in his experience of just like the incredible fall he's having and just like loss of no one knows what to do with themselves and is just taking anything they have and dragging it through the mud this this weird lock we're in in a political economy where everything is frozen and no one knows where to go well i think he's got this thing i was describing earlier with where you have this lack of meaning because of the political economy stuff because like you know he's middle class like he it, he talks about it on stage it's not a hot take or anything he's talked about how he's like from the suburbs went to like an arts high school and stuff and it's funny when he hangs out with rappers because it's like not the same situation but i don't think he understands the like the implications going on there because all of that probably resulted in this situation where this guy who has no what no material analysis does to a motherfucker like he's sitting on stage trying to make sense of everything and trying to be the voice of authority and consistently reducing things to just race which also he doesn't but then he even has a workaround for that when a black person criticizes him which is just i have more fucking money than you so i'm right <laughs> you know well, it's just it doesn't it like his he has no uh provision for the fact that you know there might be trans people who are not white, you know, like it just doesn't compute in his brain. Right. I mean, I haven't seen, maybe it does. I haven't seen the special, but like, it's oh, from what I've, doesn't. <laughs> yeah. It's like the whole problem. Right. Um, it's funny. Cause I, I went to an arts school and the way I was convinced to do it because I wanted to be a, a football player, um, which, you know, I was deprived of an NFL career, but the way I did it the way that I finally relented and was like, fine, I'll go. Dave Chappelle and Tupac both went to performing arts high schools uh, and Chappelle got to go back. I kind of want to do this now. Um, I return to your school and offend yeah. all the children. Yeah. Just right. Roast them. <laughs> yes. It would be, Look I mean, they shirt. would probably roast me, but it would be like a good, it would be a good video. Andrew's just yelling. I've done Caroline's over and over again. Like a bunch of 16 yeah. Yeah. Just doing Commedia dell'arte. I'm a beautiful idiot. A clown <laughs> is a beautiful idiot. <laughs> I mean, I tried to tell my high school like, Hey, I'm uh, on television now. And I think it's because it's a Russian uh, propaganda. They didn't respond or put me on their alumni page, but I I would get in an argument about that. Uh pull my pants. I don't know, I wouldn't do that in high school. That'd probably be a bad idea. But you know, just I would be the heel. That's what that's what you gotta do. But it, at least do it in a, a positive direction. I will show people it will be a statement against charter schools, because I am, as I've said before, the product of one. And uh so right. is Dave Chappelle. I guess I don't know if Tupac's was as well, but it's a free school that's like you know, uh that's controlled by like a private foundation. So it has bad incentives. Um, do you think, anyway, you, how far do you think you would have got it as a professional football player? I mean, I can only assume I would, I wouldn't be here right now. I would be probably New York Jets QB. Really? So all the way. <laughs> yeah. I think so. Next too. Tom Brady. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely think so too. You're a beautiful man and you could have been the greatest. Yeah, Instead, you're here been, with those fucking vultures. Could have been the Uber mensch. I, you know, what? I have, I have a last thought about this internet shit. And let me go veer off in a weird direction here. You watch the new Cowboy Bebop, right, Alex? That is correct, Jake. So I, without getting into whether that was good or not, I have all sorts of opinions. I noticed this thing that happened right before it came out on Twitter, uh, which is that. Whenever a new thing comes out, there's this repeatable like take you'll see where you take um like the old one and then the new one and you screenshot both of them and you go, look how in modern cinema everything is so washed out and sepia toned and brown. Whereas in the old one, it's so bright and colorful. Isn't cinema like so 
sad now. And this is this goes back to like cracked.com used to do these a lot. These big articles where they'd show you like um something really interesting. Like they they kind of pointed out at one point every poster for a movie, like a blockbuster movie, kind of is blue and orange at the same time. And they explain it and go, you know, this is what happens when you focus group art and you look at like just these really bizarre details that happen to correlate with high sales and stuff like that. And you go, wow, okay, we're living in a world of corporate art that is uh, corrupted by you know, the nature of everything being hyper, hyper uh, focus grouped and marketed and stuff like that because of uh, there's no money left in the economy and yada, yada, yada. And we used to have better stuff. It's like the implication. Um, and I think it's interesting, but it's also like, well, I mean, did we have better? Like, yeah, sure. Movies used to have more like leeway to play around and stuff like that. But like, I don't know. What's the greater message here? I'm not really sure. Right. So I, I saw this with the Cowboy Bebop thing. There's like a picture of the ship landing in a harbor in the cartoon and then in the in the new tv show in the new tv show it's brown and the old one the water's blue and it was really popular and then i watched the tv show the tv show is colorful as hell it's a ridiculous bubble gummy like version of cowboy bebop and it's uh that's just not a thing that happened so i was thinking about this and i was like why did this take go around so much though? What is a take, you know, on Twitter? Like, what is that? It's something that you get, you could some kind of like fulfillment out of like retweeting or just like taking on and then doing it yourself. Cause you saw it about another thing and it's complete like bullshit. It's like made up. It's a thing that you live vicariously through, you know, I was also thinking about this the other night. Cause <laughs> some friend of mine told me a story about, um, somebody that hates like uh, a person we know and uh <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying not to drag too many people's dirty laundry into this but it was it was our friend so they they're at we were out talking shit no it was not i just don't want to give her any fucking like i don't want to her to get any more reply guys and stuff from this but a, a friend of ours so somebody i know met a random stranger who's just a podcast fan and a twitter person at a party mentioned our friend's name and that person all of a sudden was like oh she's bad and then they go why and the person goes i don't remember right <laughs> <laughs> and you're like okay so you just decide like you just you're just doing a thing you just listen to red scare and shit and decided like everyone that they think is bad is bad and everything that they think is good is good and all the movies that twitter tells you are good is good john wick is great uh what fucking bojack horseman is bad you know what i mean like it's just some arbitrary yay or nay sort of thing so like that existential emptiness is like primer i guess for for something like bad to come along and point it somewhere and i mean i guess like to me this all seems so fucking creepy because you know, you got Chappelle up there talking about how, like, Twitter's not real, even though he's obsessed with it, you know, but, like, Rogan's podcast is the most listened to podcast on planet Earth. And Tucker Carlson's, like, the, what, the most watched cable news show? I mean, what does that mean, you know? Do, is it just, well, nothing happens after people watch this stuff? Or is this this cycle that we're describing on Twitter where people drive themselves demented by, like, coming up with a reactionary little little fake person to to you know become aggrieved over i don't think it only happens on twitter i think it's twitter is just one of the many things in society that you can like cable news is like a much 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 bigger scarier version of this cable news and the obvious parallel that is right there facebook yeah look at what well, facebook has done to my child <laughs> Yeah, Look at mean, what they've done to my boy. And then my boy is like post divorce and proving that he's horny and ready to fuck. And there's like yeah. pictures of him. <laughs> you have a son? I do. And he's divorced. <laughs> yeah. He's on Facebook. Did you not see this on Facebook? I'm sorry about your divorced son. I haven't been on Facebook in years, but my uh, last. My last encounter with it was like, this is so successfully made everyone I know so insane of all age groups. Like, at least Twitter people, like, if you're on Twitter, you're a certain kind of person. Like, you you like uh, uh, 
the written word <laughs> to a certain extent, you know, otherwise house. you'd be on Instagram. Um, yeah. You and logically from there on, like you kind of like fighting, you like uh, you like media criticism and discussion. You probably want to talk about politics, whereas Facebook is just like relationship statuses, uh, pictures proving you were somewhere fancy, uh, calling out people in your life who you would not talk to face to face, but actually saying that they are fake and that uh, you would uh, kill them if you, if you saw them again and then you see them the next day and it's just like well that's just facebook yeah yeah isn't it crazy how like all of these like extreme political ideologies that were answers to the ennui of living a hundred years ago or more in like some industrial factory nightmare are just also expressing themselves through this much different society that we live in that is exactly as sad but not in like a physical way it's just through these computer screens and stuff like that i think about this a lot like have the mismatch of uh ideology in the world we live in because like specifically through the realm of racism because like no matter how racist people are now they are not racist the way they were a hundred years ago <laughs> like your average racist person now even if they are like openly uh openly racist or just like thinks less of people of a different race if you were racist a hundred years ago, you like actually thought Polish people were magic or something. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> like <laughs> the level of science has advanced the part where like that's not a cog, it it a uh, cohesive like a uh, 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 totality people, anymore. People like people, it doesn't hold up. People still say things that are racist, but while they say it, they're like, "I am not racist. I just think this specific thing that." You know, right. I don't think a hundred years ago racist was even a word, right? That people even Right. Used, it was just really. I mean, it wasn't quite science the way it was in 1875, but it was yeah. like, you know, people in lab coats have been telling me this stuff about Jews or whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well Yeah, I mean I think there've always been contrarians. Uh I was thinking about like how many different like political sects there are on Twitter and how they usually usually don't translate to real life and that's i feel like that was and it's still kind of the case with college right that's the only place in like a given city that you could find oh a, a trotskyist a maoist it's not like all these different hyper specific labels would just be in the scope of the campus and people would have these debates as if they're you know meaningful outside of that that campus not that none of them are but and right, like and there's a like, stalinist party you can join in america that affects congress right. <laughs> with and your opinions yeah yeah and it was in call it was in the campus and and now it's also on online but it has yet to in a significant way really materialize yeah well that's what i'm saying about the the passive like apolitical nature of like the big movements that are happening right now, which is it's not a hundred people who are in a college campus that self identify as something from a textbook. It's just like people just like uh, sifting in a current of water and like not even realizing that the direction they're moving in is meaningful in that way, you know? I don't know. Maybe I should get off this because I'm leading to hard times and bad <laughs> men. And oh yeah, it's, uh, one. Uh, why? Well, complain? but then the bad men will lead to the good soft boys or something. The bad men will lead to hard times, which leads to the to the strong men, which I would like to uh, maybe have a have a drink with sometimes. Some of these strong men, maybe see where maybe. And we can wrestle a little bit. I did a lot of wrestling during this vacation while I was sick, and I won most of them. You did wrestling while you were sick? Yeah. Well, just with my brothers. but Oh. And they can't really help it, because like, I'm just starting shit, and then they got to finish it. Did you get them sick? Undoubtedly. Dude, everybody's <laughs> getting sick. It's November. Give it up. Uh, it's going to happen to you. Oh, we're going outside sick. again. You're fucked. I've been sick in years. Jake, you're fucked. Really? You're going to be sick tomorrow. The last time I was sick, I think I, it was when I had COVID before COVID came out. <clears throat> really? 
Yeah, I think I had it in spring of 2019, but like that sounds crazy until more evidence comes out that it was like around back then. But I literally like I was like tweeting about be- I was joking about being in an iron lung because I was just like, wow, I'm so sick. I was like watching anime and stuff. That's when I watched Yu Yu Hakusho. Oh, I remember this. Yeah. You yeah. were sick for like a week straight. I could longer than that. It was like yeah. two weeks. I couldn't walk. I had to like take an Uber to a fucking urgent care. And they told me I had bronchitis. But then when COVID came out, I was like, wait a minute. That's if what that have, was. If you have information on Jake's COVID, write into poddamerica at gmail.com. Please. And that's going to do it for this week. Let's get the fuck out of here. Plugs. Who has a show? What is there to plug? Uh, Sexual intercourse. (laughs) Sex. Do it it or don't. If you don't want to, but if you would like to, maybe, maybe you do do it. Find a someone you really trust and let them bust inside of you or inside of them. Bust inside of each other. You know. I'm waiting for my phone to boot up because I have a show and I can't remember when it is. You can come see me November 10th at the Secret Loft in New York City. Uh, We are doing another paid protest fundraiser for the DSA. Uh, Hopefully this should be monthly again and we will be doing them every month. And it's going to be the most old fun that you ever did have. Uh, Lots of hot names on this billing. You got to see it to believe it. Uh, I'll probably share the flyer on my Twitter, which you can follow at Patast, Patak Test Kitchen on Twitter.com. That's P-T-A-K Test Kitchen. And I'll put all my updates on there. Motherfucker messed up the name of his own Twitter. I change it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you can follow Alex at Anders Lee here on Twitter. No, you can't. That's not it. That's right. And you can follow him at Feral Jokes. And I'm sorry, Twitter. it's uh, DSA, not the DSA. Whatever. Listen, Fucking just Justin Timberlake, Timberlake and social network ass. <laughs> um, if you like good times, you can come to see me do comedy at Young Ethel's on December 29th. I'm doing a spot at the end of the year, even though I swore I was not. Um, and then you can also listen to my album, which is out, and listen to my other podcast, Why You Mad. If you like strong times and hard men and good fellows if you like good fellows <laughs> which is my movie of the week who i should pretty be a good. similar movie to good fellows uh lansky which is on amazon prime about meyer lansky and it's 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 very similar to the irishman it's kind of like we need a movie to compete with the irishman and so they made it but it's actually pretty good uh it's about the gangster meyer lansky and Man, it has i some, love movie of the week <laughs> yeah it has some anti actually it might be a good episode because they have you know, they have one of those uh, little dirt facts about, that I brought up one time about how, you know, the Nazis were like sinking American ships and fucking with the ports in New York. Mm. And they got Meyer Lansky to like the U.S. government got him to help them weed out the Nazis. And they like have a scene where they like are beating up Nazis and shit. It's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. A lot of pathos there. With Meyer yeah. Lansky, the Jewish Italian gangster. Cool. Um, my movie of the week is Arcane, the hit League of Legends TV show now on Netflix, which I watched all of and is pretty is debatably the next step in animation. We're all saying it. Oh, I heard it's good. It's up there with Meyer Lansky's biopic, in my opinion. You know, I usually hate biopics. That's an interesting point, but yeah. This is good. Yeah, they should put him in League of Legends. Yeah. Okay. Is All it right. Finished? It's, it's finished. finished. <laughs> it's finished.